Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our Monday Thursday service. We are glad that you have joined us for this important night of reflection. I want to remind you that in this service, we will celebrate both Holy Communion and a service of foot washing. So if you need to gather elements for those two opportunities, please pause now and go and gather what is needed. Please join me now for our call to worship. In the glowing darkness we gather. Our Lenten journey has brought us here. Jesus, our teacher and Lord, sets before us a towel, a pitcher, a bowl, bread, and a cup. He gives us an example and a commandment ever new, to love one another as he has loved us. This is how everyone will know we are his disciples, when we love each other. Our hearts are a battleground between faithfulness and betrayal. We are weak, but he is steadfast, trusting in the unwavering love of Jesus Christ, who has delivered us from sin and death. Let us confess our sin. Lord Jesus Christ, how well you know our hearts. And still you love us, you have loved us to the end. We have denied you. And we have denied our calling to serve one another. We have betrayed you. And we have betrayed your commandment to love one another. Pour out your spirit of grace upon us. Teach us how to love and serve you faithfully and to love and serve one another by the example you have set for us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now the Lord Jesus has been glorified and God has been glorified in him. Now the promise is fulfilled, and love's redeeming work is done. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found just things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. On Monday, Thursday, we of course remember that last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. And this table, we are reminded, does not belong to Bethlehem Church and it does not belong to the United Church of Christ, but rather it belongs to Jesus himself. And Jesus offers the invitation to all who are hungry to come and eat. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples for a meal. And there he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and shared it with them, saying, this is my body given for you. And likewise, after dinner, he took the cup. He blessed it and shared it with them, saying, this is my blood of a new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat, take and drink the body and blood of Christ given for you and for me. Whenever we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. Thanks be to God. Amen.
before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that this that his time had to come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him everything into his hands and he could, he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the table and took off his robes. Picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon, Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do, you do not understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus responded, those who have bathed not need only to have their feet washed because they are completely clean. On Monday, Thursday, we celebrate the Last Supper, which we typically think of as take, eat. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. This is the Last Supper according to the Synoptic Gospels, that is, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This evening, I want to draw your attention to a couple important differences in John's telling of this final meal. In all four Gospels, Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem because of the Passover holiday. In the Synoptic Gospels, the Last Supper takes place during the actual Passover meal. The institution of communion is superimposed upon the existing Passover feast, creating a, an additional layer of meaning for that ancient meal. But John reports something different. The meal the disciples share on the night before his death is not the Passover meal, but rather just dinner. In John, Jesus' death occurs on the day of preparation for the Passover. While families are slaughtering a lamb for their evening Passover meal, Jesus is dying on the cross as the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Both the synoptics and John deepen the meaning of Passover, but they do it in different ways, focusing on different elements of the celebration. Matthew, Mark, and Luke superimpose the communion meal over the Passover meal, deepening its meaning. But John enriches the meaning of the Passover story by superimposing Jesus as the sacrificial redeeming Lamb of God onto the Passover lamb. Now, thinking about how the synoptics recast the Passover meal and how John recasts the Passover lamb are both worthy pursuits, but not ones we have time for today, unfortunately. But I want to raise this key difference as it helps to at least partially explain why John's telling of this Last Supper fo focuses not so much on the meal, but rather on what happens afterward. In John, Jesus does not gift his followers a meal of bread and wine to remember him by, but rather the souvenir Jesus leaves is a ritual of servanthood. And it's not one that we avail ourselves of very often, washing one another's feet. Now we probably don't need to think too hard about why the church through the ages has chosen, for the most part, there are some exceptions, to incorporate the meal of the synoptics rather than the foot washing of John into their worship practices. We squirm at the thought of touching another's unkept nails or experiencing any unpleasant odor. Who wants to touch someone else's dirty feet, right? Especially in the middle of church. But that's not the full story when it comes to our reluctance 
We may be a bit queasy about touching someone else's sweaty feet, but even that doesn't compare to the horror that pulses through us when we consider letting someone else wash our own. No thank you, I'll keep my shoes on, please. That discomfort is exactly what the interaction between Jesus and Peter is about here in our passage today. Peter can't stand the thought of Jesus, his beloved teacher and friend, stooping to the role of foot washer. And so, at first at least, he stops Jesus. You will never wash my feet. It was basic hospitality to bring a basin of water for guests to wash their own feet. And there is occasional precedent for women to wash the feet of guests. But foot washing was something that even a male Jewish slave was not required to do for another Jew. Look just how low Jesus is making himself in this scene. At the very best, He's doing women's work. At worst, he's doing work that is beneath even a slave. Jesus' initiative to get up from the table, take off his robe, tie a towel around himself, and begin washing the disciples' feet matches the initiative God, through Jesus, has taken throughout John's Gospel. From the very beginning, it was God who took initiative to be incarnated as the Word made flesh to dwell among us. The Son, the Logos, God incarnate, Jesus, every step of the way takes the initiative to reach out to the world. As Jesus gets to Peter, he objects. But Jesus tells him this is part of the deal. If he is going to be his disciple, if he is going to follow him, then he is going to have to accept this foot washing. Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Peter, not really understanding, but knowing that he wants to stay close to Jesus, says, okay then, wash all of me, my head, my hands, my elbows, whatever anything to stay close to Jesus. Parents or teachers might recognize this maneuver. Have you ever wanted, needed your child to do something? And you would prefer that they would themselves want to do it, to do it because they understand its necessity. Please do your homework in a timely fashion so that you can solidify your understanding of what you've been studying in the classroom. But that's not often terribly convincing to a child. It just doesn't work. And so you resort to, if you want to play on your iPad, you've got to get your homework done. And suddenly, the child is at his desk scribbling away at his assignment. Peter acquiesces to Jesus' foot washing not because he accepts what Jesus is doing, not because he understands what Jesus is doing. Peter allows Jesus to wash his feet because he doesn't want to be cut off from Jesus. He wants his iPad time. Jesus expected this. You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. For now, it is enough for Peter just to allow Jesus to do this. Later, Peter will understand. Friends, it is now later, and we understand better now than Peter did, because we have the benefit of the whole story. A difficult truth of the gospel message is that accepting Jesus as our Savior means accepting Jesus as our servant. Accepting Jesus as our servant is a requirement of receiving the gospel. 
accepting that God condescended to put on human flesh and serve humankind and die on a cross to deal with sin and death once and for all is a prerequisite to receiving the gospel. But so often our pride gets in the way. We can't handle being served. I can imagine every one of us, like Peter, would say, no, no, Jesus, let me wash your feet. But Jesus insists he is here to serve. And we must accept his service if we are to accept him. This makes us incredibly uncomfortable. We'd much rather be the one serving. And then he goes on to say that this is the way we are to treat one another. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Often in the church, we go straight to the part of the instruction that encourages us to serve. And that's great. We find so many meaningful ways to serve, making meals for the United Caring Shelters, sending a card to someone who's had surgery, participating in a mission trip, raking our neighbor's leaves, setting up so we can worship together in the parking lot, sharing our financial resources with worthy organizations. Surely this is an important, essential part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. But serving is only one part of what Jesus is telling us to do here. The instruction from Jesus to wash one another's feet implicitly includes the command to accept the service of one another. To let someone bring you a meal when you've had surgery, or to let someone rake your leaves in your yard, or to let someone give you a ride, or to let someone share their abundance with you. To let someone else wash your feet, whether literally or metaphorically. These may be the things we find more challenging than being servants ourselves. No one likes to have to to depend on the service of others. When we think about this interaction between Peter and Jesus, we might consider what gifts we could miss out on because we are too proud to accept them. What gifts might God have for us, or what might God have for us through one another that we miss when we can't humble ourselves to open our hands and accept? And what gifts might we be preventing others from being able to offer because we are unable to accept them? Could we, counterintuitively, be a stumbling block to another's faith by our stubborn refusal to let them serve us. This humble acceptance of the gifts of God and of one another may cut against our natural grain of wanting to earn our own way and never be a burden. But that is not gospel thinking. Jesus shows us on the night before his death that we are never a burden for one another when love is at the center of our community. When we love like Jesus does, we are free to serve and be served without shame or guilt. This is good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Because we are worshiping from home this evening, we're able to do something that we probably wouldn't do if we were gathered here in the sanctuary. 
This is an opportunity for us to get to practice what Jesus instructed us to do and wash the feet of those we live with. As you do that tonight, I invite you to reflect on what it's like to be both a servant and to be the one who is served. I recognize that some of you might be alone tonight and unable to participate, and that's okay. Still take a moment to feel the coolness of the water and to think about what it would be like to have Jesus wash your feet. Does it feel humbling, uncomfortable, joyful? Let us pray. Loving God, as Jesus took a basin and poured the water long ago, we bring this basin of water before you. Bless this water for washing and bless the feet of your servants too. Wash away the stains and strains of this life, we pray, that we may walk anew in the ways of Christ. In true humility, we bend our lives in service to you. Help us all by your example to grow in understanding how we are meant to serve and be served for love's sake. In Christ we pray, amen. Now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Tonight we have remembered the night before Jesus is betrayed. We have shared in the holy meal of the Last Supper. We have had the opportunity to wash another's feet, or at least to meditate on Jesus washing his disciples' feet and what that means for us as part of our Christian community. And we all know what comes next. We know that Jesus is betrayed. We know that he is tried after a fashion. We know that he is forced to carry his own cross, that tomorrow, Good Friday, he will die on that cross. And so now we enter into this period of waiting. The silence of God. And we will see what Sunday brings. Mm -hmm. 